Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening from Singapore International Photography Festival here. And uh, welcome also to both our speakers uh, for today's conversation between photo book publishers and photographers. And here, I would like to extend a welcome to our online um, visitors, online uh, listener here. This is uh, the festival's ongoing online programs to connect you and everyone in the community despite closed borders and stay home notice. My name is Gwen Lee, the director of Singapore International Photography Festival. And it's my pleasure today to introduce the photographer and the publisher and to facilitate this conversation. To begin, a very short introduction on the festival. The Singapore International Photography Festival founded in 2008 is a biennial um, gathering of minds around the world with the common pursuits of advancing the understanding and appreciation of photography. It aimed to be a much needed um, arena for critical thoughts and discussion on photography in this part of Asia. The festival also functioned as a key platform to discover and nurture through its educational and public engagement programs. At the core of it, we believe that uh, photography can be enjoyed by all. So SFDF is organized by DEC, a photography gallery, and uh, Art Photography Center is a uh, recipients of National Arts Council major company grant. And um, how's a very short uh, introductions on uh, our speakers for the day. Thomas Savin is uh, no strangers to SIPF and the photo community in Asia. In 2016, uh, he was invited to exhibit the work uh, Hand Colored together with Chinese animator Lei Lei in Singapore. Through this uh, rendering and collage and, and cyclic process of hand coloring, scanning, uh, it was a terrific exhibition that even to today remains in the mind of many. And also with us today, we have uh, the photo book publisher, Joel Linia, who will be actually sharing on this collaboration and residencies that he has worked with Thomas Savin in publishing the book, uh, in this published book, 17, 18, and 19. And uh, without further ado, I will leave this conversation to both of them to share more about themselves and of course the book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you for, uh, for having us. We are very happy with uh, Joao to be here to talk about uh, photo books and to talk about um, the nature of the relationship uh, and the many possible relationship that can exist between a photographer and artist and, uh, and the photo book publisher. Um, we're very happy to digitally meet uh, new friends uh, in Asia, even if we can't really see them, but that's the first, uh, that's the first step. And um, the way we're gonna proceed today is, um, Joao and I don't know each other forever. We had, uh, we had a previous life before our honeymoon, our photo book honeymoon. And, uh, and, and before, before that honeymoon, I we thought it might be uh, good to actually, um, I take a bit of time to introduce myself, introduce uh, my work, and then uh, Joao will do the same. And then uh, by, uh, in about 20 minutes, we'll see how our path uh, just uh, started crossing. So if we uh, look at the, at the first slide, um, so basically I'm a French uh, collector and artist. I spent uh, 12 years in uh, China from 2003 to 2015. And um, the photo that you can now see on your screen um, was taken in a day that quite changed my life. It's the first time that I met this guy um, in, the sub, in the suburbs of Beijing. And uh, it, he actually, uh, his work is to recycle trashes which uh, contain silver nitrate. So he works in a recycling plant, he collects trashes and uh, he extracts the silver nitrate out of it. So when I saw that, and when I saw that he was destroying so many images, I struck a deal with him to buy the negative by the kilo. 
I started a project which is called the Beijing Silver Mine Project. And, um, and uh, it's been now 11 years that I buy a lot of uh, negatives as raw material from, from him. Altogether, I collected about uh, 850,000 uh, negatives uh, over the last 11 years. And this is how they look every time I buy them. I just come back to the studio with a big bag of 50, 60 kilo of negative. On the next slide, you can see how my studio looked like when I start going through this material. Photography is great. Unfortunately, you don't have the smell and the smell is not always the most pleasant part. So this project is a, is a long story and I won't um, uh, tell uh, more about it because that's not the purpose of, of today's talk. Um, my point being very soon, I felt the need to share uh, many stories uh, that I identified in, the, in this large collection through the mean of a photo book. Of course, I collect physical objects and quite naturally, uh, I felt the need to actually find ways to, to share those photos uh, through, the, through physical object. And the photo book turned out to be quite a, a perfect object to do that. Uh, probably a better object than the, a better tool than the exhibition because uh, there is something where the object stays and it can travel and so on. So what you can see here is the, is the 10 books um, I've published over the last seven years, uh, different, uh, different shapes, different stories, different uh, uh, collaboration with uh, different publishers. And uh, I naturally don't have uh, enough time to um, present and go through all of them, but I selected three of them, which are uh, quite important in uh, the way I learned about the, the relationship you can have with a publisher. Um, and if we start with the first one, it's the Silver Mine Albums. So that's the first book I made in 2013. At that time, I already started the Silver Mine project for four years. I had about 250,000 images. I had a lot of themes that I thought would be very um, interesting to share. And then I came with this idea of this little um, Laparello albums where I could put like prints inside that something you can see in the, in the next slide. And, um, and I worked on it with a Chinese designer called Mei Shuju, and we uh, created these albums and I created the selection of 100 prints. And when the book was uh, pretty much ready, I just uh, went and see a um, London-based uh, publisher called the Archive of Modern Conflict. I showed them the object and uh, I believe they, they, they liked it and they decided to publish it, which basically means that they were not really involved in the production or the conceptual um, aspect behind it. They just took it as something that was not published yet and that they, would, that they were happy to actually pay for. So they would cover production I would keep an amount of copies. They would keep uh, an, an amount of copies. And for pretty random reason, uh, financial one as well, we decided to make 200 copies. So the book uh, was a, a bit unusual. It was all handmade. The material was uh, uh, pretty unexpected as well. And, uh, and it turned out to be uh, pretty much of a success and it sold pretty well. And as it sold, the prices went up and a bit out of control. And within one year of time, it was basically sold out and the copies were selling for 500 euros a copy while the original price was 80 euros, which is not low, but not crazy high neither. I was very happy at the beginning about this outcome because I thought there was something going on with my book and uh, I could make some money with it. So I was very, uh, I was very proud. And this feeling uh, uh, fainted uh, pretty quickly because I realized that uh, it was gone. A couple of copies went into a specialized collector's hand. Not no many copies actually were sold in China 
while those photos were uh, taken by Chinese and the book was mostly made for, uh, for, for Chinese people. So uh, it, it turned out to be a, a bit of a frustrating experience for me. So the second book, which I published in, uh, in 2015, uh, Until Death Do Us Part, is something that I did with a Chinese publisher, uh, Tia Zhezhu. So first of all, it was important for me to work with a Chinese publisher. Second of all, it was very important, given the first experience of the Silver Mine albums, to have better control on the quantities and the price. I wanted something that could be accessible, that price would never go up, but then that means that if it sells out, we're free to uh, produce a second edition, a third edition, and so on. So the price remained within 25 to 30 euros, and now it's a, uh, and now we're on the fifth edition. So altogether, we made now 9,000 copies of this book and uh, it traveled all over the world. It's a, it's a cheap object, it's a nice object. And uh, I really liked things uh, going that way. Third um, book I wanted to briefly talk about with the two minutes and a half that's left um, is the next slide. Um, and uh, so this is a photo album I collected in 2014 uh, in Shanghai. It turned out to be an exercise book made by a photography uh, student uh, in Shanghai in the, in the early 80s, in, uh, in, um, in 1984 to be exact. And we can see the exercise book, the contact print, an envelope, uh, within the envelope was the original negative, then we can see the comment of, of the teacher. Um, I decided to work on this, um, with this album uh, in a collaboration with a um, Venice-based uh, Japanese artist called Kensuke Koike that you might know about. Uh, he was not uh, very well known at that time. And uh, what he does for about 10 years is that he, he, he actually do collage and cut out of vintage photographs. I'm not very interested in collage, generally speaking, but I was very interested in his process because he always respect one rule. And that rule is that he can do whatever he wants with a, a, a print, but he can never take anything out or add anything in. So it's always, an imagination exercise of what a photo can become, but it's only made out of itself. So I gave him all the portraits that appeared on this exercise book, and then um, and then um, and then he started doing his intervention. When that was done, we had a series of 27 photos. And we decided to do something which is a pretty unusual process when it comes to collaboration between artists and publishers. That we had the original album, we had the 27 works, back, the front and back. The, the back is pretty interesting as well. It's completely white, though uh, you can still see the scars of the interventions. And um, I had a pretty vicious idea, which consisted in actually sending those files to three publishers, Skinner Books in Italy, M Edition in France, and Tia Zhezhe in China, and invite them to play a game, which is rule one, publish a book in an edition of 400 copies. Rule two, make sure that this book is ready for Paris Photo 2019, which was November 5th or something like this. And rule three, definitely the most important of all, as soon as you've downloaded those files, you're not allowed to exchange with us anyhow. You download the files, you do whatever the fuck you want with them. You are not allowed to send a mail. You're not allowed to send a message. You're not allowed to send questions about design, PDF, or anything like this. And it turned out that they immediately agreed because it was heaven. For once, they can produce a book and they won't have the artist on their back saying, oh, no, I want the color of the cover to be changed or anything. They can do what they want. And they knew that two other publishers would be working on, on the same material. 
So they needed to make something where they were pretty sure that um, uh, the other publisher would, wouldn't do the same. And that was an interesting thing to do because also it allowed uh, to see uh, what can happen when you give full freedom to a publisher, uh, which has the soul of an artist as well, because they're interested in the physicality of the, of the object, because they're working with designers. And also it shows how uh, the soul of the work that we made with Kensuke can completely change shape and spirit when it's like inserted and included in another object. So maybe um, you can go through the next slide very quickly. Uh, just uh, that's the one with Tiazadju. If you go to the next one, you have uh, the one made by Skinner Books. Next slide, you see that actually they printed this from one plate that they cut smartly and that they folded in a way so it makes a book. So it was the no more, no less spirit. And then next one was the one made by M edition, which is very beautiful, but doesn't translate well in images. And you have, and you have the, the selected varnish. So it was an interesting experience where, uh, where I learned also to give more freedom to, uh, to the publishers. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop here maybe. And uh, Joao is going to take the microphone for uh, his little freestyle. OK, thanks, Thomas. Uh, well, uh, my name is Joao. I'm a third of Void. Um, but OK, maybe next slide, and then we start from, from Void slides. Right, Void. Yeah, that's Void. Uh, so I'm a third of Void. Like, my name is Joao. Um, I'm from Brazil. I am based in Lisbon. And right now, I'm in Reykjavik. Um, Void is also Mirto Estiro uh, and Silvia Sahini, my partners. Uh, we found Void in, back in October um, 16, uh, 2016. And basically, we, we, we opened Void as, a, as an art space. Um, and that art space basically um, was something that we created to fulfill our need as an artist. We have a photo of that in the next slide. Um, yes, thanks. So this is the second space of Void. Like uh, this is where Void it is today. Uh, we start in a different place, but uh, mainly uh, the three of us we were um, practicing photography. The three of us, like uh, we are also photographers, and uh, we decided to open a space that would fulfill our creative ideas, uh, so that we could do things the way we we wanted it to be done for us as artists um, through exhibitions, through micro publishing I would say because our, our initial idea was to publish some zines and just keep doing zines for ourselves and maybe friends uh, and also uh, bringing some interesting photographers for for learning um, uh, teaching workshops and so basically we we tailor made a space that would would match our expectation for uh, for our creative expectation though when we started void um, for the opening of, of the space, we did nine fanzines for Greek photographers. So um, my partners, they knew like nine um, young Greek photographers. Some of them they didn't know, but uh, we approached them anyways. And um, we produced in four months, uh, nine zines for the photographers. And for the opening night, we decided to put those fanzines to, to, um, on a table to sell. Okay, hold on a little bit because this is a bit further on the, on the talk, thanks. Uh, and, and um, uh, what happened is that those fans, they, they barely sold out in the first night. Uh, we did like a, we cashed a lot of money that we were not expecting to. We actually did those zines, think like, okay, we're going to sell some zines for, through the next year. And we literally sold, sold out zines in one night. Uh, we had like two or three zines to, to sell for the, for, for the following week. And then we're like, okay, there's something interesting in this publication thing. Like uh, maybe, maybe that's not a bad idea to focus a bit on that. And, and this is a bit um, what happened to us. Like um, soon we understood a bit that um, for a self-funded space or, or not space because um, we were not a space, like we changed the space. So like uh, we were not attached to that, but uh, for a self-funded project, uh, we soon realized that um, we could do exhibitions, we could do workshops, we could do publications. And uh, from these three factors, uh, exhibition is the one that we're not paying back. It's something that uh, we were giving too much and, and getting not really uh, much back because there's not a base of collectors in Greece and, and we were not like um, happily um, 
achieving good results with exhibition as we were with our publications. So we start focusing more and more in, into the publication thing. And soon we, we, it happened for me to, to be designing a book for Antoine de Gautam. Uh, and what happens is that the, the, uh, in, in a short, like I'm making, making it short, uh, his publisher put him down, like I let him down. And, um, and the book could not be published. So we just gathered the three of us at the web and said, okay, why don't we publish it? I was designing it anyways. Uh, we have a book ready. And then that was our first non-zine adventure. So we put that book out. And we also had a really good reaction to that book. So uh, it, it, it was a bit of like a, a luck thing in the beginning. And uh, we were um, having kind of good reaction to people from the the things we were putting out. So uh, our zines went well, and then we had this first book that went well. And then let's say this image that you are looking on screen and you're tired of it, but um, this is a project we did. And that's a bit also uh, of the, the kind of um, um, identity that we try to keep. That's to be kind of uh, spontaneous as much as possible and, and reactive and not to, to as cerebral as we are like um, uh, through our gut feelings doing stuff. So this is an open call we did and we, we received loads of images. We used the space of this gallery uh, to like, a, we edited on, on the ground and then we pasted things after editing in the, in the walls. And then the, the publication out of it that was a zine by the time, um, are reproductions of the wall into pages of the zine. And it's, it was pretty cool by the time. Um, we also did things like open call on, on Instagram. We, we did two covers on Instagram. We, we received hashtags that we received images. We added in a sort of like impromptu style and we're also making a publication out of it. And so uh, this is a bit of our DNA, like um, to, to, to be reactive to, to, to things and not to, to think too much and not like a, use less brain and more guts, let's say. So uh, can, we, can we go to, to the next uh, slide, please? Thanks. So like a, this is one example of uh, one of our less publications. So I'm, I'm doing a big jump in time now, like a four years in time, because it's a bit irrelevant for this conversation right now for me to keep like a, a track of like a chronological track of void. But uh, um, this is Loic Segan. Is my pronunciation good, Thomas? Loic Segan? Loic Segan, not bad, not yeah, bad. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Um, so um, he's a French photographer and this is his first book. So. Uh, I selected uh, his book to, to show, not to talk much about the book, actually, because this is Loic's first book. And uh, we met Loic because he attended one of our bookmaking workshops. Uh, so we were, we were amazed with the, the, the work that this uh, uh, police officer that was also doing photography uh, brought to us. Uh, and it, 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 it was so intense and so... Um, uh, impressive for us that we're like, okay, let's just make a book out of a workshop. Uh, so, and, and this also is something that is quite important for us uh, to support up and common artists. And we like uh, half of our publications are probably from artists that are publishing their very first book. Um, and we're very proud of it because uh, we have a feeling of uh, having a, a great support to, to up and coming artists and, and to people that are struggling to, to put books out there. And usually we, we bet a lot, like um, we, we are not super concerned initially uh, for the commercial part of it. We are like more instinctive, like, okay, we like this work, let's just go for it. And, um, and sometimes, okay, sometimes we regret not being that commercially oriented, but, uh, but we never regret putting a book out, even if it's not necessarily a, a commercial success. Um, so our, our following books are also like a first books from photographers. So the next one, it's called Sleep Creek by um, Dylan Hausdorff and um, Paul Gilmuth. Uh, this book, uh, it's, I can, for me, it's, like a, it's a, a really, really good example of an amazing first book of photographers. Also, like, um, they came to us through an open call. We did this hunger project that I'm briefly talk very soon. Um, and uh, we invited artists that we admire a lot, that we, we found that the, um, the work was strong and connect to, to what we want to talk with that project. And we also did an open call to be able to, to receive um, projects from people that we never heard about. And gladly we received um, submission from Paul and Dylan. 
and we also like when we received that we're like okay that, those guys are really good we we should make uh, more out of this so we also propose them to make the book and we're very proud of this book um, the next book we have is Dimitra's Dede uh, Mayflies. Dimitra Dede, she was uh, one of the nine zines that we did uh, on our opening. She was one of it. Uh, so she had um, a zine called uh, A Study for Mayflies because she knew that she would like to make a book out of it, but she was not like, okay, this is not a zine. I think that's more than a zine. This is actually a book. So for her to feel comfortable that like, okay, let's just like make something and you don't, don't need to call it the project. You can say this is a study for a project. So we did that zine and, um, and after she kept working on the project, she, she was approached by some publishers. She almost published with other people, but end up like that uh, we kind of convinced her <laughs> that we would be nice for her. And, uh, and this is also a book um, that we published in November last year. And uh, we, it's also her first book, as it is the next book, that's um, Obiscura de Profundis by Tolo Parra, um, that was just published like uh, two months ago. Um, and Tolo is also a good example uh, of um, first book that uh, we are very proud of. He also was someone that approached us on Hunger Project. Uh, we, we, we were uh, unaware of his work and he approached us saying, okay, I have this uh, project. And we also were like, okay, this is more than just like a four spreads in a, in a collective project. Um, so th th those are basically like a good examples of first artist uh, books that, um, that we put out. Um, and the next book that I'm, I'm gonna use as an example of Void is Olivier Pinfat's Meat. Uh, that this is a, a book I think that represents a lot the, the way uh, we like to work. So we did this book and when, when Olivier approached us, he said, I have this massive project and, um, um, and um, uh, I would like this book to be a beast, a, a monster. I, I, I want this book to be difficult. And then we were like, okay, we've got the briefing. So uh, we did this book that's a bit out of what we used to do because we don't play so much with like uh, foldings, fold outs, and you open here, you make 20 billion papers. But for this book, we use eight different kind of papers. Like uh, I think we use six different printing techniques. We have even toilet, uh, not toilet, kitchen paper for, for, for the book. Like uh, maybe in the next image, you can see um, on, on the top right image, that paper, that's, that silk screen, it's like a, it's printed on a toilet paper. The down part is like a typography press. We have Rizzo, we have Xerox, we have a, a, a weird black um, ink thing that uh, we did digitally, and this is hand bound. So we decided that this book should be unique. We would hand bind um, and we would also, uh, instead of numbering it saying, okay, this is the copy one out of 300, we would actually, because it would take so much time to make this book, we would write, this book was bound by Merto, Silvia, whoever is binding it, at the day, at the day X to uh, from hour 1.35 to hours 3.48. And then you would have a very specific numbering and coding for a book that you know, like when it was done, how it was done, how handmade it was done. And it happens that it was so much more, like we were so naive when we did it, that this book went out in September uh, 2017. Yeah, uh, yes, 17. And, um, or 18. But anyways, and, and we had like a, the space for you to, to fill with the time that the book was bound. You had like a, an, a, a space for, for a day, a space for a month, dash 2018. But we actually finished binding this book like a January this year. So <laughs> this is the amount of time we took to finish 300 books. They're handmade. They're like a, a billion pages, 32 signatures. So and this, but, and we are very keen of having done this. And like, uh, we, we miss not making more things like that uh, because the, the more we grow, the more uh, we need to make books with bigger run that doesn't allow us to, to go so deep into handmade. But um, this is a balance we, we always are looking, uh, are trying to, to keep a bit for our practice to, to don't uh, go so far to, to industrial production, production, but also to keep a bit of our DNA. And then for the next slide, that's the last slide that, um, that I'm, I'm talking on. Um, 
this is a page of hunger project and the hunger project was a flagship project for void i would say uh, it is a bit of a manifesto that we did and uh, i'm not going to talk about what hunger is because if i do i would spend like 20 minutes soloing about hunger but mainly we come from um uh from zine making from the south of Europe. We are like not uh, in a hub country based in, in Greece. It's not like being based in France or in Germany or in UK. Um, so we were always struggling with the fact that we are in the outskirts of, of Europe. Uh, and also like uh, when you start a project in photography, there are so many projects and such a struggle and photography itself, it's it's like, um, it's not an easy, um, platform to navigate it's like a, uh, it's not as hype as might have been like um, um, years ago so th this was a bit of a, a project manifesto that we call hunger and uh, for this project we invited a number of um, artists that we admire a lot uh, most of them were very kind to say yes to this obscure weird never heard of uh, greek publishing house uh, and Thomas Sivan was one of those. And some, we also did an open call and some, some other people submitted and we found out amazing talents. But this image that you're seeing is a project that Thomas, uh, that's one of those kind um, artists that we admire a lot said, okay, of course, how do we do it? And how, what's the deal? And uh, um, what should I do? And um, he submitted a project that we loved. We were like, okay, wow, well, that, that's amazing one. So like it was, uh, fulfilling for us because we, we were eager to 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 work with like uh, some names that uh, we were used to to see work and then we were like okay design and put together some pieces of, of those artists so this is how uh, Void met Tomasova and um, and uh, and uh, okay for the record by the way this is also a project that uh, was not good enough to just being like four spreads of a newspaper and then Tom also put a book out, but he didn't speak about this book here in this conversation, but that's an amazing book. Um, and okay, and then it starts the, the, the brilliance. Yeah. Thank you, Joao. So, so yeah, that's exactly how it happened. Then we, I knew about uh, Void publication uh, and, I, and I was really uh, liking them a lot. And then one day they reached out uh, and asked if I would be willing to participate to, uh, to Hunger. At that time, I was working on a, on a new book called Great Leaps Forward. I just uh, um, digitized all the work and I decided in the same spirit of No More No Less to simply give all the files to them and um, and let them uh, create something out of it and uh, they did something um, very nice so it was a, a nice uh, starting point a couple of uh, months later um, the void crew Mirto, Silvia and Joao contacted me and uh, asked if if I would be interested in uh, doing um, a residency they were inviting me uh, in a residency and um, because of the nature of my practice, I never really did residencies. Yeah, uh, I just keep on collecting things. I build an archive and basically I need to be next to my images. I need to be next to my scanner and to my printer. And if I end up in a beautiful countryside house uh, with my brain and, uh, and my pen, I'm completely useless, right? So I was a bit, uh, I, I had mixed feelings uh, about the idea of the residency. Then I said, why not? But uh, we need, I need to, to identify uh, something that we're going to work on. And uh, the nature of their invitation was pretty interesting because it was almost like a performative photo book residence. They didn't say, yeah, you can go to that place and just think about your things and whatever will come out will come out. They say, okay, we're a small independent publisher. We don't have much money. We don't have much time. If we invite you there, we want to make a book. That's the goal. That's the final goal. And we wouldn't be happy not to do one. So there was like an, um, an obligation of result which uh, which I found pretty uh, pretty interesting. And then if you move to the next slide, 
um, we'll come back to um, to this uh, archive. The second bag I collected from uh, Xiaoma, from this guy working in the recycling plant, was very different from anything I collected from him over the last 11 years. It was one bag filled with 15,000 black and white negatives all coming from a detention center in Beijing. I could, by going through the, the photos, uh, identify that they were all shot between 91, 92, and 93. So that's a bag I collected in 2010, one year after the project started. I really felt like it was something special, something unusual, something uh, that you don't often see when it comes uh, to uh, Chinese photography. And uh, I was um, a bit, um, how to say, I was worried, I was still in China, and I was worried that actually uh, taking uh, those photos out uh, would uh, jeopardize the project, would compromise the project, yeah? Because it's uh, somehow sensitive material, I shouldn't uh, access to it. And then I was worried that the overall project, which is uh, less, more, less sensitive and uh, which is give, uh, giving a, a nicer uh, uh, face uh, uh, to, of China um, to see, uh, and that there would be a conflict. Plus, I had someone working full time uh, scanning all the negative from Silvermine. And I decided not to give him those negatives because I was worried as well that he would see this and that he would be uncomfortable and that it might be uh, complicated to work with him after that time. But the images were quite. Uh, were quite amazing and all the mugshots and all the evidences photos. And uh, I kept on looking at them as negatives on a light table. I didn't see them as positives for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And um, I just found this back yesterday. Uh, if, if, you move to, uh, if you move about two slides, that's a dummy. I did in, uh, in November 2000, uh, 2010, as you can see on the, on the bottom right corner. Uh, it's not even a dummy, it's just like A4 a uh, pages badly printed and I'm trying to put my name in very big on the cover. Uh, all this to say that from 2010 on, I started playing with these photos and trying to do something with it. And I never, ever managed to do so. So when Void invited me to do that, um, that residence, I say, now might be the time. I left China in 2015. I'm invited to do um, a residency in Portugal by, uh, by uh, together with a Brazilian designer and uh, for a book to be published by a Greek publisher. So that was like um, uh, an, an international uh, uh, collaboration and it felt about the right time. So if yeah. you move to the next slide, basically what I did is that uh, I went through the entire archive, which is composed of 15,000 negatives, 13,000 of them being mugshots, and 2,000 of them being evidence. That's uh, objects shot by the photographers and which are linked to the reason why those people would go to the detention center. I decided not to use the mugshots because uh, on each and every of them, or almost, at least for the portraits, you can see a plate and on that plate, you can see the name of the person and the date when uh, uh, this happened. And as it was shot in the early 90s and the people were very young, uh, they are likely to still be alive. And I, and I thought it would be inappropriate to use them no matter how beautiful the photos are. And I bumped into uh, uh, many uh, photos of evidence, uh, which I found completely, um, completely mesmerizing. And some of them reminded me of this series that you might know, uh, um, which is called The Beauty of the Common Tool. Uh, 
and which was shot by Walker Evans in the in the early 50s for Fortune magazine. And you have a very uh, uh, totemistic photo of a screwdriver and uh, the object is like, uh, looked like a statue and everything. And sometimes I could find this same feeling in this, uh, in this collection. And so it would be pretty interesting to work from this. Of course, I didn't pick this uh, uh, raw material to work on uh, randomly. I knew uh, Void Universe, I knew that they were uh, exploring m many uh, black and white images, sometimes darker uh, universes, even if it's not a rule for them. And so it felt like it was the right material. I suggested that to them. I made a selection of about 250 photos that I printed on little um, on a stack of, uh, of little prints that you can see on your screen that I have here. So you can see that they are like very small. And I put these in my bag and moved to Portugal where I met uh, Joao. And maybe Joao, you can uh, tell a little bit about the, the, the context, both yes, in sure. space and in time of that week uh, of that sure. honeymoon we had. In sure, Portugal. sure, sure. <laughs> so uh, this residency, like it's not that Void has a residency, especially that Void has a residency in Portugal. What happened is, my kid attends a school in, uh, and one of his um, friends, uh, his fa um, her father is a photographer. And uh, once we talk and we're like, uh, oh, okay, I'm a photographer. Oh, okay, I work with photography. And then like, uh, we just find out that, okay, we had a lot in common. And then Duarte, that's the, the, the photographer, the Portuguese photographer, he told me, all right, so I, my uncle has a, a, an amazing uh, space, um, on the countryside of Portugal, right in the middle of the of of Portugal, and he 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 wanna do an art residency there. Uh, so as a starting point for an art residency, we cannot just say art residency it's open and just come by. Okay, maybe we have a we have a hint of how it's the residency in the in the next slide. And uh, so this this is a bit like um the, the, the space. The space is called convento. And convento means uh, I mean uh, convent probably <laughs> or uh, yeah. Yeah. Convent. yeah yeah okay so yeah. that's an easy one. Yeah um and uh, this used to be a, a country house in a farm with um, with a chapel. So this is the chapel of the house where the residence would take place. They also have a kind of like, um, uh, um, uh, not guest house, it would be a really wrong way of saying it, but um, it's an amazing place in the countryside of Portugal, something like uh, two hours from Lisbon. And then he told me, look, I would like to start this, this residence program, but uh, I, I'm really, I, I know some artists uh, that I would try to contact, but I would like to, would you like as Void to invite an artist, a random artist, and um, we, can make a, we can make a deal that you can invite it. Uh, you cover some costs, I cover other costs. And, and then I came to, to Milton and Sylvia. Uh, my partners and uh, we're like okay we have this what do you think and we we're like okay that's an amazing opportunity uh, to work fully um, on a book that we want to publish if we invite an artist that we want to publish and then we were a bit like okay so let's make our bucket list and uh, and like the three of us like the first name was like okay why don't we call tomato tomato mine's okay so let, let's just send this email so um and we just, uh, okay, because we had this starting collaboration with the Hunger Project, it was not like a, so difficult to just approach him. Like it was not something out of the blue, like he came to Portugal for an adventure. It was more like, okay, you know us a little bit and like uh, we, we are interested in, in, in making a book, but uh, we must make a book because for us, like um, at, at, from Void at least, every shot should be like um, uh, precise because uh, again, we are independent, so funded, and we, we don't have like a, a lot of people working for us. It's just the three of us. Uh, so we cannot like waste time, money, and, and everything. So we're like, okay, we have to be efficient. Uh, and that was the deal with, with Toma. So uh, what happened is we flew Toma to this amazing space. <laughs> like uh, when he came, he texted me, he said, man, you would not believe where I am. And I'm like, oh, is it nice? He was like, okay, you're going to see it. <laughs> 
And then um, what, what you can see on the photo is the view that I had from my studio, from my working yes. space. Wow. Uh, that, yeah. that was very really nice. And, and I might say that that's a good photo that makes not real justice for, for the space and the acoustic of the space, like the sound, the way you speak, because it was a chapel, like a, acoustically built to probably for a choir or something. And like a, you used to speak and like a, my voice would be beautiful there. It's, it's something like a, no, there, there, there were magic no, it there. it wasn't. It, it wasn't. wasn't, okay, but almost. <laughs> Uh, and then we, we spent like um, a week working there and our routine was basically um, Thomas was resident and I wasn't. So I was in Lisbon. I was taking a, a train every morning. I was to take the first train in the morning. I would come to when I was close to the station, I was writing him like, hey, honey, pick me. <laughs> and then he would ride 15 minutes to the train station because it was a bit far from the train station. He would pick me, would bring me to the residence, he would spend the whole day and uh, he would rush me back to take the last train to Lisbon. And so, and, and this like um, repeated for, I think the whole week. Um, and um, so- That's a lot of work. work. Yes, it, yes, it was a lot of work. It was like a one hour, 40 minute trip train like uh, every day in and off. But like, uh, I mean, I was so excited, like uh, the, the material that we were working on uh, was very exciting and the place was very exciting. And like, uh, and, and, and my bromance with Thomas was so exciting. We had this really beautiful honeymoon in the countryside of Lisbon. And um, um, no, it, it was really like, uh, we had this, uh, I mean, sometimes when you are working on a project, you have this kind of, um, I'm, it's a, it sounds a bit cheesy to say like this, but like this creative energy, like I, it sounds really cheesy, but uh, <laughs> who, who has it might understand what I'm saying. Like, and sometimes you are stuck in a place, in a creative place, you, you feel like you cannot move, you don't understand exactly what to do with a project. Um, mm -hmm. But like, uh, it was not the case in this week. Like uh, this week we felt like, uh, from the starting point, we were like, okay, we know we're gonna have it. it and it was flowing and it was, uh, really nice so in the following yes like um this is basically like um uh, a good example of our daily routine like uh, we were we were editing and doing trials in the ground and also like uh, we were taking what we produced there to the wall that uh, you can see also in the next slide so we were gradually like uh, working and building and coming back and also like um to say that after i come back to um, to lisbon uh, Thomas, he would still spend time trying out things that we did, like a, a kind of uh, um, making proofs of what if what we did was too good or not, like how he reacts after a, a long dinner with full of wine with like a, interesting people. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, there were a, a, there there were another residents there, like um, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there was uh, we, it was the four of us and. Uh, and the team was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. The dinner was were pretty long, but in, indeed, after that, I, I sometimes would uh, come back to my studio and uh, and probably stay up until like three or four in the morning to keep on working on the thing. You explained that, but I explain it again because I I think it's very uh, it's very uh, crucial to the project, and that's what um, I really like about it is that. I arrived on a Sunday night at midnight. I left one week later on a Sunday night at midnight. And then we had this daily routine where Joao would arrive late morning. We would work uh, all the afternoon. Late afternoon, he would come back to Lisbon and I would have dinner and then I keep on working. And then it starts again the next day. So as you can see in the, in the photo, uh, that that was taken on the maybe second day where we where we uh, started like working on the on the sequencing. So the material was already identified. It was already um, uh, we were already happy to work on that. And then we started working on the on the sequencing. And uh, when um, we had doubts, we made mistakes and so on. But no matter what happened, we were always quite. Uh, seeing the same things we were quite on the same page which which yeah. was very lucky because sometimes 
things doesn't go that most smoothly between uh, between a photographer and uh, and a designer. But because of uh, we knew each other's work from the beginning, and we knew that it was fairly likely to work, and uh, and Joao had plenty of experience with uh, previous photographers, so he knew what the distance should be and the things you should let go and the things you shouldn't let go. I had experiences with previous publishers, so. I knew that I didn't want or that I shouldn't or that I mustn't try to control everything. And it seemed to be uh, the right place and the right time to actually work on that together. And once again, I insist, uh, we made a book out of this archive in one week. And that's something that I didn't achieve to do by myself in 10 years of time. And uh, sometimes, it's very, um, I think, deadlines in the in the photo book making are something that's very important. If you give like yourself all the time and all the possibilities and and, and this, then you you're pretty likely to get lost because mm -hmm. there is no uh, there is no obvious and final call for for such an object so we had this and then we were going through the editing and it was working quite well and then on the way back to Lisbon Joao was putting this together in those amazing pdfs where it was basically like the simulation you see on the screen so it felt like I was already seeing the object and seeing how it looks and seeing what was going what was good, what was not, and then we were sleeping on it. And the next day, Joao would come and say, this doesn't work. And I was like, this doesn't work. And what about doing this? And as the days were going, uh, then suddenly the sequence uh, seemed to be right. Uh, the, the objects were, were like organized in, in, uh, in almost an archeological, anthropological ways. The faces were taken away. So it was like a, a sum of objects, a sum of still lives all coming from that detention center. We could feel like they were not associated to uh, heavy crimes, more maybe like more like thieves in the street or someone who just used the tool to sneak in someone's home and to steal a pack of uh, of cigarettes or something. There's no like uh, the archive, and it's important to mention that it doesn't involve like blood and dead babies and violence and so on. It was a detention center, it was not a, a jail, it was not like murder and heavy crimes. Murder might have happened, but from what I can see in the photo, it's more like people stealing TVs and VHS uh, uh, um, viewer and uh, and so on. So if, if they are decontextualized, we don't have <clears throat> names, we don't have explanations, we don't have time. The only thing we have is the object and next to it, this little ruler, which in most of the cases, and for some reason, was cut between 16.5 centimeters and 19.5 centimeters. So that ruler would show 17, 18, 19, those three numbers. And that was something that coming back maybe with 50% of the evidence photos, with 50% of those objects. So by the Wednesday or by the early Thursday, things started to really take shape, didn't they? Yeah, it, it was like, a, um, we, we, we could feel that the book was almost there. And like a, what you can see on the screen, by the way, like a, you can see that there's a spiral in the, in the digital render of these, of these mock-up presentation because we were like okay this book could be a, a spiral bounded uh, bound book um it would make sense for us for this kind of uh, forensic and stationary uh, feeling to it we were in love with the solution honestly mm -hmm. Uh, and many decisions were already settled in our minds, like uh, the color of the cover that's going to be that peach like salmon like thing, um, that it would be printed on black paper. And why would it be printed on a black paper? It's because like uh, the reason that Thomas said that he lived with this uh, book for a long time as a negative form, like um, he, he used to sell these on, on his um, uh, light. Uh, light room table board, yeah. table light, light table, table yes yeah. thanks um, th therefore 
that's how the image was stuck on his mind. Would make no sense to just invert it after he lived ten years with an image as a negative form. Why would we ever like a just positive it at some point? So uh, a negative um, feeling image would make total sense for this book. Therefore, okay, let's print it actually negative. And also, I, I really love the fact that instead of printing white on black paper, we printed silver on black paper because okay, it's a a, a silver mine uh, project uh, after all. So uh, we, we, we find really subtle um, reasons and strong uh, connection and agreements to do it. And one thing that I'm uh, also to underline, and we are overkilling this, this thing, but uh, this was only in one week. And this week, by the way, was, uh, I think it was by 20th of September and Paris photo would be by first week of November. So we, we were producing a book that we, would have it for a very photo like a, we, we were talking like a, the, the the four of us because of course Merton and Silver they were always in the loop uh, like a, we must have this book for, for, for Paris and uh, it's not something like a, that you just do like this you come out of like an end of uh, September with a uh, with a design and you just have a book for uh, delivered in Paris for for early uh, November so um, when we came to, 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 to a moment of uh, reaching a, a final and good sequence, uh, the very last thing we did is as soon as Thomas flew to, to Paris, okay, maybe we can go like um, a couple of images like uh, after past the image of the negative. Yeah, the next one. Okay, so like uh, then we, we started to, to make the very final tuning on design because um, uh, this book was so much like uh, uh, taken care of that we didn't want to, even though we were in a hurry of time, like, okay, we need to send files to press, period. Um, though we didn't want to, this book to feel uh, as done in a hurry, because even though it was in a um, timeline hurry, uh, in our mental space, we were absolutely crafting every single detail of it. So this, uh, this is a nice... Um, uh, shot, let's say, um, we just didn't the colophon like, okay, photographer, publisher, uh, whoever do this, this, that. Like uh, I did a form, I submitted a form to, to Thomas that was already in, in Paris and I said, you fulfill this as if you're filling a, a, a formal document and you, you make a copy and you send it back to me and then I'm going to use it. So he printed it out, he didn't do it digitally, He's, he just fingerprinted it, he handwritten it and he sent it back to me. Um, so you can see like the, the form I submitted and the form that he sent back. And same for the text, like uh, the text we produced also the, for the next page, like uh, we produce also the text and they told him, look, I don't want to do it digitally. Would you mind like just printing it? And, and I mean, just the fact that you print this text and, and fax back to me, let's say, um, it would be good enough. And then the next slide, you were going to see something that I really love in, in a very subtle detail I, for uh, this book. Joao, I stopped yes. you for one second, yes, talking, yes. talking about the text. And that was uh, very uh, uh, interesting as well, is that uh, um, it was written um, together with uh, Holy Russo, who was in China at that time. And, uh, and, and um, I, just, I just told her, okay, I'm working on this and I'm, I'm, I would love uh, to uh, have your help on this because she's a very good writer. She knows uh, the Chinese uh, material really well and she's an um, English speaker. So for all these reason, reasons, it was pretty perfect. But then I told her, okay, it, everything needs to be done in 48 hours. So herself, even outside of the project, really uh, um, followed that flow. And then I received the, the English text from her and sent it to a Chinese translator and it was uh, translated into Chinese. So by the end of the week, Sunday at midnight, we had the title, we had the book and the sequence and the content, of course, the decision on the main decision about production, uh, we had the text, we had the colophon, and, uh, and, and that's, uh, that's pretty unusual. And then I did left, I did leave uh, uh, for Portugal, and then this was in Joel's hand. And the uh, next step was to, was to go to, to the printing. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe we could advance one. Okay, this is a, a very time subtle detail that I love in the book because like uh, this book is about a forensic um, kind of work. Uh, 
And uh, we have this fingerprint of Thomas that uh, it happened when he printed and sent us back. So uh, I, I love this kind of uh, um, um, forensic feeling to the book that's unexpected one. Okay, so the, the next slide. Um, all right, okay, this is like, um, uh, it's the ruler that Thomas was talking about and uh, all right. And, and okay, this, this um, image here, uh, Thomas said that this ruler was cut through 16 and a half to 19 and a half. Uh, therefore, at some point we were both like, uh, okay, I, I think I have an idea for a title. And the other, yes, me too. So what's yours? And I was like, <laughs> as if we could speak at the same time, 17, 18, 19. So, it, it, I mean, it was sort of obvious for us, like uh, it was inside of us already. But uh, one thing that, that uh, strikes my, my, my inner curiosity and like, what I think that's really the no, non-obvious part of it is that uh, if you pay attention to the photos in, um, that they are on the book with the 17, 18, 19 ruler, uh, they are not the same ruler. It's not that there's this one ruler that's used 50 times. Like um, mm. you notice that of course, some, some images, they are, keeping the same ruler. But uh, some images, they're just like a 10 different rulers or more. And then like, uh, why in the hell those are the parameters for, for forensic Chinese uh, officers to, to cut a ruler for? They could have cut anywhere else or they could mm. have one ruler and produce like a 20 different, like a three centimeters uh, specter. But no, like uh, they did it with this one parameter. The, the, I mean, the, the fact that I don't have this answer is one of the things I really appreciate in the book, that not having mm. the answer. But okay, uh, that that's uh, about the, the thing. And, and I was supposed to, to talk about the production, uh, that it's the next step we, we went through. So basically, like, um, we... Um, Thomas flew to Paris, I came back to Lisbon, I just fixed the file and I was sending file to our print in Turkey, Ufuk at Masbat Matbam. He's an amazing guy and a really good printer that we collaborate in like a 90% like of Void's books, I would say. And uh, um, as soon as I was uh, half flying, finishing the book in the airplane, basically sending files in advance and discussing with him like, okay, what we can do, what we cannot do. And then, okay, uh, the next slide, it's like um, the, the photo of the, the book we did. And uh, one thing for the book is, uh, as you can see, and if you know the book, like uh, for, for, for the next photo, that's clear, uh, the book's not spiral bound. Because, mm -hmm. of course, like uh, when you come to, to produce a book, and this is a, a, a rule for life is, uh, you are not having exactly the book you want to have it because especially especially if you want to do a performatic book that is produced in one week, printed in one week, delivered in one week. And two. so uh, the art of making books is the art of compromising and, and, and handling like your stress and um, uh, and 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 the beauty no, of this no, art is no, no compromise adaptation adapted yeah. yes that's the thing <laughs> that that's the word <laughs> because that's the beauty of the thing like uh, at some point you need to make like a um, tough calls like uh, you're not going to have exactly what you want and for mm -hmm. that you need to to make wise decisions to maybe don't have what you want but still have something that um it's good so uh, we missed a lot the first information that the book would not be able to be spare bond. It's not only because of timeline, the timeline was also a, a, a problem because we would be able to make a spare book. Like, um, uh, of course, it's actually an, an, easy, an, an easy call for a printer, but we would not have the spiral that we wanted for the book. So like a, we wanted a metallic discrete black uh, ruler um, that especially when you open the book, uh, the book, when you have a spiral, the book tilts down a little bit because, uh, and we didn't want the image to be like this, but because the book got a bit out of our control on the amount of pages, like uh, we were like, okay, this might be a hundred page book. And then up to being like a more than 200 page book, uh, the, the thickness of the spine made technically the spiral game to be something that would not make the book so pleasant because you would have a closed book and then you're gonna have a spiral this big out of the book. It would be a bit like a not nice in your shelf. And okay, we, we grieved the, the loss of the, of the, the spiral, spiral binding. binding. 
Yeah, but and it turned uh, out and it turned out to be uh, to be uh, wonderful. Now, if we yes, had to do it yes. again, I would prefer it to yes. be uh, as 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 it is. It looks like a like a cold weapon, you know. You could yes, like, exactly. attack someone yes. with it. Uh, yes. Well, I I see that it's been exactly one hour <laughs> yeah. that we started talking. Oh. We're not doing too bad, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it, yeah. be, before we before we eventually move on, I think it maybe it would be nice to see if there is uh, any questions that we could yeah. uh, answer. Yeah. And if there is no questions, which happens sometimes, we have a plan B and uh, other things to talk about. So, anyways, okay. if if you guys want to ask questions, feel free to do so. I think uh, while waiting for people to. Re, uh, respond to asking questions while waiting. I I just want to say thank you again for this very insightful talk. And uh, when I think about photography and how the invention of photography in the early days, one very practical function of photography is actually used as evidence in the court by the police or the inspector. And in this case, uh, while we are looking at these archives, while it may be telling a uh, hard facts, right? Evidence as a very hard facts. But from through all your sharing, it also shares that while it also requires this tremendous amount of imaginations to, to actually imagine what this archives or what this evidence image could be or may be or even manifest in a book form. So I feel like this sort of a balance between like factual information because we are still talking about archives here and this equal importance of imaginations that truly is the one that make this work come into the light of the day into a book form yeah so and i also very curious you know uh well i also had to add in that this book has this very nice touch uh towards the end uh whereby the last image is actually a box of a uh, fuji flow yes and it's sort of like <laughs> it's part of the evidence, right? Yes. 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 Well, that's the end. That's the end of the story. It ends with uh, camera as evidence and the film as evidence. Yes. That that was a very carefully cherry picked last image. It's like mm -hmm. a, absolutely not playing random. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And yes. Okay. They start uh, the, the 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 whole. Beijing Silver Mine projects to start with collecting negatives, collecting film, and like, okay, we, we are making this beautiful book. Uh, there's no better way of finishing than to, to have a negative, uh, not a negative in this case, like still undeveloped uh, uh, film to it. Yeah. It, it. It feels like, a, and also like a, an ode to photography and, and everything. But uh, mm -hmm. one thing when that you said that I, it always guided our, our kind of instinct when we were uh, editing uh, in the wall, is the the curiosity of like a, of what the evidence would bring like a, what sparks the que the questions that it sparks and like um okay we we, we were seeing some uh, one image but maybe if you go too further um, yes one two three images further please uh, we we were like aware after seeing uh, uh, two two images more and the next no no uh, after actually. So like uh, we, we were seeing image and we were clear that we were not talking. Uh, okay, we are not detectives, okay? But we could figure out that we're not talking about the murders because uh, mm -hmm. there was not real uh, evidence of, like a really rare evidence of blood, uh, like two or three drops of blood that was probably like a, uh, kind of like a small fight and not everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were aware, okay, this is not about like a, have crime it's not murders not uh, abuse or anything um, as as dark as that so it, we, it was like uh, people making small robberies and can, can we go two more images yeah no, actually like, actually, like actually to, to the other direction no we are coming back mm. okay i think i was also very surprised by the fact that this uh, negative exists in a way that it could be found by Thomas Savin in the in this recycling plant, because usually uh, negative of such nature 
seriously speaking, will be actually stranded or burnt immediately rather than pack out in the in the plastic bag and then dispose it elsewhere. And yeah, uh, <laughs> in, in, in that in that um, that's a, that's an interesting thing to say. But when you think about it, uh, actually, it's pretty likely that this detention center gave this bag to Xiaoma, knowing that he's going to put everything in a pool of acid in order to collect the silver nitrate. So it wasn't the safe, safest way to destroy the material, and they could have done it in-house. But on the other hand, they knew that it would be destroyed. And, uh, and then uh, Xiaoma sold the bag to me, and that's how I accessed something I shouldn't have accessed. But once again, and I, I, I believe we've been discussing this for, for a bit of time now, it's quite, uh, it's quite interesting that uh, it ends up in a, a pretty, uh, I mean, the book is, uh, is pretty gentle. It's not very uh, aggressive. You don't feel embarrassed looking at the photos. You don't know anything about it. The loop, the loot and the cold weapon starts to mix together. And I like to see it as a, as a very good way to get an inventory of all the objects of desire of a place and a time. Let's say we're in the early 90s, the police, they record that. Then we can see that there's plenty of TVs, there's plenty of audio cassettes, the watches are something very trendy, the sunglasses and the alcohol and, uh, and, and so on. And uh, if the same thing was to be done today, the, the set of, uh, of, of, of images and the set of objects would be very different. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's always a nice way to deal with archives, to try and see what emerged um, almost organically from, from this raw material. Yeah. I think we lost Gwen, but yes. uh, I'm still here and you're still here. Yeah, yeah, we are still here. Oh, I think uh, there's a question. Did you yeah. see? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to join the event. Uh, is it possible to come in your void space after the Corona times in Athens? Hello from Russia. Hello, Russia. Um, yes, it is. But uh, though uh, we are really because of everything, like because of 2020, uh, we are really unprepared for what's going to be the next steps, like uh, for mini reopening and like a uh, scheduling and program. So for now, void space is basically where we are stocking our books and a, a nice space, but we are not throwing any special event, even though you can absolutely come by to see all the books we ever published. We have some books for, we have our books for sale. And maybe, hopefully, by the time you come, we are throwing any exhibition or anything. But by the time we have no, uh, we have no uh, program for uh, until until it's something's programmable uh, in in uh, in the near future. So uh, okay, I, I I would like just to make a, um, a, a final note. I was uh, I was about to say something about that image. That's uh, that's. To be on screen, and uh, it's basically like a, a, that Gwen was asking about the fact that this might spark curiosity. And for me, this was the biggest puzzle of the whole book. And like a, this image that's totally out of tune with uh, the, the the whole tune of the book, um, it's an image that I kind of struggle with, Thomas. Uh, because he was keeping putting it out and I was keeping putting it in. So if this image destroyed the book, it's my fault. If this book, if this image makes the book genius, it's my, it's my praise. But for me, like, if you look at that, like, uh, just brings, like, I can't stop having questions about, like, uh, why is that an evidence? Like, uh, who steals that? Or who <laughs> plays something that goes to, 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 to a police department through that image. So for me, like, uh, 
uh, I really love this this aspect of the book because, of course, you, you have weapons, you have tools, and then they are kind of easy connections, and they're they are really beauty beautiful images. But some here and there, you have those really weird, like um, you have cassette tapes, as Thomas said, that gives a sense of time, but you also have things that just give no sense of anything. It's just, mm. it just gives you confusion. And I really love when, uh, when you have like a confusion in a book that brings you weird questions. To me, to me, the one that's, uh, that's the most confusing, even probably more than this one, uh, is the deck of cards. I really like the deck <laughs> of cards. Why, why, why would you have... Uh, a deck of cards and uh, just like uh, take it yes. as an evidence because yes. even if it was stolen you probably <laughs> don't put someone in the detention center for having uh, stolen but then maybe it was used to actually gamble on money and something so then it, yes. it, it becomes yes. an evidence but yes there's a that's what's nice about it and we're not uh, investigators we're not policemen what we like is when we don't know much yeah. about yeah. the reason why an image exists and then the stories we can build from them that's a that's a mm -hmm. fiction uh, all, all created from reality I suppose. yes yeah and, and i think uh, it's also interesting like the objects here review the popular objects of that time right mm, yeah which is like yeah. the 90s the cassette tapes the audio uh you know exactly. stereos and like and uh seeing all this actually also bring back this nostalgia like uh you know objects of the past items of the past that which which is uh again bring back that whole stories that these are actually old negatives that shot in the 90s mm. yeah. yes yeah that's um yeah I think sometimes with strange combinations where you can see a photo with a cassette just like next to one shoe you know and uh, it, these are like still life which i find very beautiful if i was a photographer and i'm not a photographer uh, i would like to still to shoot this kind of photo just an audio cassette next to a shoe but then i would need to find a good reason to do that something we didn't mention in the book yeah, and we didn't show actually, or maybe just only one slide, is uh, at the end of the book, we decided to add a sequence where you can see 12 profile pictures. So to, uh, uh, earlier on, I said that for uh, many reasons, I decided uh, not to use the mugshots uh, because you can see the date and because you can see the face of the person and his, and his name and so on. But then when it comes to the profile picture, uh, you cannot see this information. Plus we knew that we would print like negative. Uh, so that's silver on black paper. Plus uh, I uh, deliberately uh, selected with, uh, we deliberately selected with Joao images which are like fairly uh, random uh, damaged or, or like uh, chemically challenged. So, the sequence of all those objects uh, some, at some point is, uh, is like uh, the rhythm is being stopped by the series of, of faces. And, uh, and I think that's a very nice uh, and very important element, a very important sequence within this book. So it's all about objects of desire, but a few faces emerge within this inventory. Yeah. Thank you. And also we do have a question coming from our audience here, uh, all the way from Russia. And the question is to uh, Joel here. Yeah, yeah, we, I, 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 we address, yes, yes. <laughs> we, 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 we lost to Gwen for two minutes and for oh, okay. two minutes, I answered that one from, from Jane, right? Now I know the name of Jane, yes. <laughs> thank you, thank Thanks. you for Thanks. that. Thanks. Yeah, you know, um, how, uh, while they are like, I think we, we might have been running a bit long, but yeah. I, I just one last question for both of you because uh, it's very interesting when Joel shares that about this sustainability pertaining to exhibitions and, and later on this slowly evolve in a very organic way to publications because that is more sustainable. And, uh, but I also believe like the process of uh, say putting together a exhibition 
question is very different from putting together a book because the book involves so many other collaboration from the printer, designer, etc. And also, and last questions from uh, last question for Thomas. You know, I understand that uh, you know you have introduced to us ten different books that you have made over the last uh, nine, ten years, and I was. I'm I'm just curious, like, at what decisions, what are the what are the deciding factors for you, given that you have so much wealth of uh, resources, images here to decide to collaborate with a publisher, as com as opposed to publishing the book yourself, as an artist book, which also had happened in in over the period of time as a in that ten book. Um, so, mm. and this will be my last questions to both of you. Yeah. Uh, to answer that question, I mean, depending on what's uh, on what's the idea and um, and what's the print run and what's the finance behind it, all all scenarios are, are possible. But generally speaking, I would say that. Um, I think it's always better to work with a good publisher than rather doing doing things yourself, because um, making books is uh, not only about uh, identifying a, gr a nice group of pictures and finding a, a fancy way to put them together. There is just so much behind it, and sometimes people actually don't really um, don't really know or, or understand that. But first, there is this the design element, which is absolutely crucial and good independent publisher, uh, especially like Void uh, tend, tend to make that very clear. And second, uh, all, the, all the knowledge behind the production of the book. And then once the book is printed, the crates arrive. Trust me, it's better that they arrive in the hands of Void than in my hands in in, uh, in in Paris, because then the machine goes on. You know, we're talking about uh, online communication. We're talking about going to fairs uh, all over the world to actually uh, uh, represent and be the ambassador of the book. We're talking about all the logistic behind selling books and shipments and discussion with customers and. Uh, as many things as I'm not very, very good at. So it's not only like an administrative uh, help, it's like, uh, it's like all the way. Conceptually, it makes the book what it is. This book wouldn't exist without Void. And then when it exists, it, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it participates to, uh, um, it benefits of this ecosystem that the publisher have created over the last years. And yeah, maybe I could try and self-publish it and post it on Instagram and I'll have 600 likes and maybe six people will buy it and it's gonna be a financial disaster. You know? So I, I would say it's always better to work with a publisher. It's always good to collaborate anyways. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that answer. And um, Joelle, yeah. um, re, re, like the earlier questions I shared about like uh, making uh, exhibitions and making a book, the processes and uh, actually pretty, maybe to a certain extent similar, but also very different. And uh, for you, you know, um, what what is the process for you, you know, in making that change? Yeah. For, for, sorry, for, for, for which thing you going Like when you, you, when you remark about uh, no. the fact yes, that yes, exhibitions yes. on sustainability. Yeah. Sure, sure, and, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, we started Void with zines, um, rough exhibitions uh, that we didn't even have um, the money for framing, let's say. Uh, and education, we just, we're thinking about bringing some photographers to, to, to teach. Um, so the balance basically is, uh, if you wanna be a, a sustainable uh, organization, you, you need to find, uh, funding is vital and your time is vital and the amount of people that works with you is really important. So um, we don't have, um, 
that many funds it's self-funded so the initial investment was from the three people avoid putting some money in void and say this is the capital we have if we bankrupt it's gone if we multiply it's good for everybody uh, what we learn is at least for greece at least for the the, the the south european reality we don't have a market for for collectors and we and and we also were not so uh uh, used to to the exhibition universe we are not curators we cannot claim to 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 be curators like uh, when we are starting something uh, even though uh, i was always a um, i was already a, a designer so i could uh, design and we could publish because i had a bit of understanding also for things that i've did in the past uh, so financially speaking is an exhibition would bring zero return and X money investment from us. A book would bring uh, would bring like um, some return and five X investment, suppose. But it pays back and gives some money back that you can you can you can add to to your fundings. And the workshop parties, um, it's the one that you need the least investment. You need to invest less than to make an exhibition and much 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 less to make a book. And you have you have a, a good return over over the the, uh, the investment uh, because the logistic is is the is the, the most complex part. But then you don't have like a to pay printers, paper, stock, and distribution and PR and blah 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 blah. Uh, so for for survival, we just said okay, we cannot afford to keep doing exhibitions as we were. Like we were just taking the money so that we the few money we get from books and putting on exhibitions. So we rather like a keeping the ecosystem of the books, like a, to make books to make more books. Now uh, it's still like a, when when I say that books make some money, it makes some money. Like a, it's not that uh, it's uh, that there's a, that beat club. Um, a really good publisher from the US. They have this mug that they do that is there's no money in books. That's pretty much true. Like, uh, if you are making books, you know that you are not gonna make a full living on books. Like, uh, you need to to supplement with something else. So, I think that the balance we found to to for financial sustainability is to to make an education program that's like a, a basing bringing good teachers to 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 do workshops. We do our own workshops, so on bookmaking. Uh, that we are kind of investing to do more than we were doing because we got super excited and like uh, we are super uh, happy with the results from the students we have like uh, end up having amazing uh, books out of like a one week workshop uh, and uh, focus on the books. And, and in the end, it's also a matter of passion. I think that like uh, the three of us at Void, uh, we found out quite quickly that we love the book making universe it's it's sexy it's like um it's it, it drags you in and you, you it's something that makes you fall in love at least for us the three of us much more than um to put an exhibition and then to to put an exhibition down uh the kind of reaction you have from people is also uh, warmer i would say because our experience with, exhi with exhibition is people come to see your exhibition and say hmm i'm not sure i like this frame or Hmm. Why did you print on that paper? So people are looking through the images. They're looking through like a, they're not actually there. They're they're kind of like a, um, uh, they have a, a glass in their hands, like a drink some alcohol and, and paying attention to 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 collateral um, signs of what you're doing. And when the book is uh, that might happen. People might say, oh, okay, why is it a hardcover? Why is not? I like the binding. Right? But they take it home. Who, who gets the book, takes it home and lives with the book? Like, um, it's something that uh, you carry with you, right? Um, and, and if you don't like it anymore, you put for sale and someone else is going to carry it. So um, uh, I think it's a different relationship as well. That I think it's more loving relationship than... <laughs> then uh, i think that books love and and um, and, yes, um definitely. yeah exhibitions more like uh yeah quick and like and i guess that there's always something so lovely to actually hold in your hand and read on your own pace or in the privacy of your home and your yeah. public space and thank you again to joelle and to thomas for such a thank lovely you. sessions with all of us uh, who are from all different parts of the world tuning in to listen to such awesome talks from both of you. 
I, I couldn't ask for more because you have really answered in great details on this whole process. And I think ultimately, we hope that these sessions will also prove, provide this uh, sustenance to everyone out there to look into books making. And if you do have a desire to make books, like what you said, it can happen within seven days, like what can happen. But there's also this involvement, which is really interesting between the publisher and the photographer whereby when there's this focus in mind to make something that matters, it does happen. And I really, truly thankful again. Please give a virtual applause <laughs> to whoever that is out there. Yeah, Thank you. yeah for this talk and for those listening uh, here with us, there are limited signed copies by Thomas available at DEC. And also, if you are interested, you could purchase all various titles at Beijing Tilver Mines and Void Publishing. Well, and for those that who have enjoyed this uh, afternoon talk, uh, dialogue sessions, uh, whether you're in France or, or in Iceland or in Singapore, do join us again tomorrow, 8 p.m. with our curators, John Toon, photographer Bob Lee and George Wong on their works pertaining home in this during this pandemic yeah so thank you again and thank you to both of you Thanks, thank, thank you. you for having us thank yeah. you to everybody thank you. thanks